Good morning. Let me invite you to take your seats as uh, we're ready to begin as it's the top of the hour. Nine o'clock here in uh, Cleveland and then six o'clock in World in Second Life. My name is Lev Gonick. I'm Case Western Reserve University's Vice President for Information Technology Services and the university's Chief Information Officer. On behalf of our organization, along with the whole host of university sponsors, including the University of Provost, the uh, youth site, uh, the Faculty Senate Committee on Information Resources, the Council of Technology Officers, um, the HR uh, organization, the University Library. Uh, we want to invite and thank you very much for taking time to spend the day with us here at the first uh, Technology Collaboration and Campus Engagement Dialogue or Summit. We also want to take time at the top as well as uh, throughout the event this today to thank our underwriters and supporters uh, who are, whose logo wear uh, are meant to uh, dance over all of the various pages that you see and, and screens that you see. But I uh, want to thank in particular uh, the folks from uh, Apple and Cisco, uh, Dell, if you haven't put in your business card or written up your name. Uh, there's a drawing for an outrageous Dell computer system as a giveaway. I think at lunchtime you have to be here to, uh, to be able to receive it. Our friends at EMC, IBM, uh, Mobile Discovery, uh, Perceptus, and One Community. Thank you for all your support. So this morning I have the uh, pleasure of kind of kicking off, in addition to inviting, uh, thank you for being here, I have the opportunity to kick off uh, our conversation. Today's summit really focuses in on the explosion of mass collaboration tool, massive collaboration tools, sometimes known as Web 2.0 tools, um, and really to invite you to be part of a conversation on user-generated content, the explosion of user-generated content. Part of uh, the ability to really create that degree of user-generated content uh, presumes, has a very important premise. Uh, and that is that we have pervasive and ubiquitous access. And our kickoff panel this morning really is to talk about uh, what happens when not only a campus is wired, but what happens when the community around it uh, is, has that same degree of pervasive and ubiquitous uh, access. We know those of us who teach in the university environment, or in, in fact in any environment, know what impact wireless access has had to our teaching and learning environment. Uh, it's definitely changed the dynamic. Uh, it certainly has disrupted the, the general ways in which many of us who grew up in a different era and taught or learned in different eras experienced the learning environment. And there is this ongoing conversation that we have about whether or not we should be asking students to put their notebooks down uh, or not. Um, but in addition to that kind of a dialogue, uh, we also managed to have a very interesting dynamic that happens outside the classroom. Many deans at this university have, who were re uh, originally fairly reluctant uh, to support the rollout of wireless six years ago here on this campus have subsequently shared with me that it really has had a transformational impact because learning seems to extend beyond the classroom because students are gathering in the hallways and in the cafeterias um, and in the library areas and really engaged through this quote unquote invisible umbilical cord that connects them back to the network and to each other. Well, what happens if that's the supposition, if in fact the walls between the university and the community also become blurred, just like the walls between the classroom and the general campus life have become blurred? What happens when that takes place? What impact will it have uh, in terms of community engagement, in terms of extending uh, the academic learning and research agenda of great universities like Case Western Reserve and many that uh, you, are, you are involved with around uh, Northeast Ohio or the state of Ohio and beyond. That's the kind of question that now actually uh, sits before us as a broad uh, community. Um, we have gotten used to the idea that the moat around our universities is no longer an acceptable present premise with respect to um, our relationship with the community around us. And many, many of us are convinced that technology provides a platform for bridging uh, the relationship between town and gown. Um, but if we're expecting to have 
Uh, the degree of user-generated content, which now explodes on the campus, extend to the community around us, we also have to think through and attend to uh, the rollout of pervasive access services across the community around us. And today, in this kickoff panel, um, we're going to have an opportunity to explore that uh, collaboration between Case Western Reserve University uh, and one community. Um, our first uh, speaker that I want to just briefly introduce you to uh, is Ryan McKay. And uh, Ryan today, I have to make sure I get his current uh, uh, consulting group. I certainly know where he comes from, so that part will be easy. Uh, the name of his consulting group is the uh, Ivy, uh, let's make sure I get it right, Ivy League Consulting. Uh, but previous to that, um, anyone who was in the wireless Muni Wi-Fi space for the last three or four years uh, knows of Ryan. Uh, and that's because he was a senior technical project director for Earthlink in just about every, every city uh, across the country where Earthlink was engaged in trying to, to roll out the first generation of um, Muni Wi-Fi services. And we thought that that would be a really good way to start the conversation, getting the view from across the country, which will help to contextualize what Mark Ansbury and his colleagues who are up on the panel well, we'll have to tell you about what we'll be rolling out um, and announcing in just about uh, 10 minutes or so. So with that, please uh, join me in, in uh, welcoming Ryan to the, t the table. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I hope you'll bear with me. I, uh, I like to have that podium, but I'll uh, juggle these notes as we go along because I want to make sure I get my uh, facts and figures correct. Um, I have uh, like to first of all thank you all for the opportunity to come and speak with you um, and share uh, in the excitement of this event uh, and share uh, my perspectives on uh, broadband wireless. Uh, over the last three years, uh, I've had the opportunity to be involved in 11 municipal deployments. Uh, whether that was the design, the construction, or the operation of municipal networks, uh, going back. Uh, Three years ago, uh, when we first did a public-private partnership with the city of Tempe and Arizona State University to cover the 40 square miles of Tempe with ubiquitous Wi-Fi, uh, we wanted the students and the residents of the city to be able to use the wireless network anywhere that they went uh, to be able to access the information that they needed. This morning, um, next slide. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the place of broadband wireless uh, really in a global context and in a competitive arena. Every day I'm surprised by the creative ways that uh, we apply technology to business and life. Uh, rarely does a day go by that I'm not astonished by the creative ways that we apply technology. Recently, uh, I upgraded my cellular plan, as many of you go through on an annual, semi-annual basis, and uh, I added unlimited text messaging as an option on my cellular plan, which I was, I was, I was like, okay, an extra 10 bucks and I can do unlimited family plan. Well, my daughter, 16, went from zero to 4,653 text messages in one month. <laughs> I got exactly three of those, by the way, and I was counting because I kept them. Um, she can now type faster on her number pad than I can, frankly, with a keyboard. <laughs> um, and I'm amazed at the way that she is connecting and communicating every day. Do you know, every day, oh, I gotta get into the light and uh, I guess on camera. So every day, the number of text messages sent worldwide exceeds the population of the planet, and it's accelerating. She's connecting with others and learning in ways that are really amazing to me. She wants to learn Japanese, so she spends a lot of time on YouTube listening to native speakers, and now she's even gone to the next step, and she's video conferencing with native speakers in Japan. They're learning English from her. She's learning Japanese from them. She falls into that category of 70% of the teens who say they would rather give up TV than give up their computers or the internet. She is globally connected. She always has been, and it will always be a part of her life. Unfortunately, for the majority of our citizens, there's not always an opportunity to participate in this engine for change and growth. Excuse me. Uh, Ask yourself, and this is, this is a fundamental question, what is the nature of freedom? 
For me, I answer that by saying I believe the nature of freedom is fundamentally opportunity. Opportunity for education, opportunity for participation, opportunity to be economically self-sufficient. You can't have freedom, true freedom, without opportunity. Next slide, please. About 10% of the world's population, some 600 million people, have access today to connected computing. Evidence suggests this number is going to continue to grow dramatically. Mobile telephony already is reaching, or promises to reach very soon, 4 billion subscribers. Currently, we have about 3.3 billion cell phones out there on the planet. As Moore's Law continues to drive down the cost of computing, new form factors appear to better fit our everyday lives. More people are using wireless to enable communities essentially to leapfrog ahead of us. A lot of the developed countries that don't have that infrastructure now are going to be in a position very shortly to leapfrog us in technology because they're bypassing legacy technologies and going straight into wireless and connected uh, systems. Computers today are 8,000 times cheaper than they were 30 years ago. However, there's still a significant gap in the availability to participate in this new connected information age. Surprisingly, even here in the US, Google today processes nearly a billion searches every day. Roughly one third of those are from within the United States. The rest are from everywhere else in the world. Next slide, please. Consider a world no longer restricted by lines and cords. Truly, the future of telecommunications is a total wireless access solution, one seamless total communication experience. Increasingly, in this global competitive ecosystem, the growing demand for faster information access and enhanced communications and the need for place and time independent access or mobility is growing. The nature of the world is changing. Just in my lifetime, in the last few years, I've seen us flip-flop of what was once wired is now wireless. What was once wireless is now wired. Consider the changes in the physical delivery of content, music, mail, movies. I wouldn't personally want to own a movie rental business at this time, particularly if you're renting DVDs, because more and more that content can be delivered to me through iTunes, through a host of other places where I can download the content that I want. Consider the changes in the pressures on global delivery of voice products, the cost per minute going away, the long distance charges going away, the impact of Skype and other technologies on our ability to communicate with anybody anywhere in the world. Consider the changes in education. I'm an academic. Three years ago, I was the dean of a network and communication management program for 21 campuses across the country. I was going through the pains, and many of my faculty and staff were going through the pains of students wanting to time and place shift their learning. They wanted it on their terms, at their location, where they wanted, where they could learn, where they had the time and the fit. These foundational shifts and opportunities uh, are essentially changing the fabric of our culture, it's changing the fabric of our country. In the last 30 years, we have created more information in the previous 5,000 years. Every day, 3,000 books are published in this planet. If you don't have access to that information, how can you fully participate in the economic opportunities that it presents? Next slide, please. This is my new toy. Uh, I keep it right here uh, with me every day. This phone has more computational power and memory than my first four computers. Incidentally, that was a TRS-80, a Mac Plus, a Mac SC, a Mac LC, followed by a personal computer, and then I went back to a Centris, et cetera, et cetera. It's very difficult, I think, for some people to comprehend the amount of information that I have at my fingertips riding right here on my hip. Indeed, more information than the entire Library of Congress terabytes upon terabytes of information available to me anywhere I go, anytime I need it. I'm no longer restricted or tied to a card catalog or stacks of books at the local library. In fact, I made the mistake early on helping my kids through school saying, let's go down to the library. Let's look that information up. Not anymore. It's Google. Google this, Google that. 
and they find the information that they want. At no time in our history has mankind had more access to this knowledge and information, and every day new and exciting opportunities are created as a result of this access. Companies' competitive edges are defined by what do we know, when do we know it, when can we do it. Imagine if I can sit in a sales meeting with somebody, pull up an inventory list, and to transact a business transaction on the moment right there when the customer wants to buy, as opposed to my com competition who may have to go make a phone call, go back to the office and fill out order forms or do other things. I can close more business, move faster, and be more agile with this connectivity. This is truly my new computer. With its Wi-Fi access, its phone and mobile data, this is what I use to communicate the majority of the time. Next slide. Mobile access has become a vital element in the lives of well over three billion people worth worldwide. Simple voice connectivity has been shown to provide greater economic opportunity and, and empowerment. As new capabilities migrate to these portable devices for photography, for data storage, companies must all explore the vast new population, uh, the vast new opportunities that this represents for populations. This is truly becoming the personal computer, and it will be the personal computer for the majority of the world. The market for embedded Wi-Fi clients, PCs, PDAs, etc., is growing at a 62.2% compound annual growth rate. This year, 226 million units will ship. The industrial age is over. Welcome to the global information age. The proliferation of these devices is a testament to that fact. Next slide, please. In addition to mobile technology, wireless forms of computing and communication are critical. Wi-Fi meshes, WiMAX, and a host of other new forms of connectivity, connectivity will radically change the landscape. What will happen when a market stall vendor in a third world country can take an e-cash payment? What will happen to the money supply? What will happen to the new efficiencies that that will bring to the third world and other parts of, uh, and other parts of the world? What will happen when the world of microfinance, a proven model in which the developing world is using, with an estimated 50 million borrowers increases by a factor of 10? How many of these other developments will have a lasting impact on our lives and the living standards of people in the most remote sections of the world? Unfortunately, we must ask what will happen to our neighbors right here in the United States who don't have access to this technology, to this information, to this opportunity. Broadband penetration, unfortunately, in the United States is falling behind every year. Surprisingly, we're not the leader in broadband penetration. Indeed, we're 15th among developed nations. So there's Denmark at the top. There's us at the bottom. Uh, the Federal Communications Commission still defines broadband as 128 kilobit. They're considering moving that up a bit. <laughs> While other developed countries are pushing fiber optic communications to individuals and businesses, moving multi-megabit to gigabit speeds, we slip further down this list every year. Is this truly a loss of opportunity for us? Next slide. In the 1880s, the U.S. opened vast opportunities to the West by growing the country by establishing a network of railroads. This infrastructure opened up the West and allowed for economic growth and development. Soon after that, the interstate highway started and allowed us to grow even further. Next slide. Today, the infrastructure that needs to be built is the global telecommunications infrastructure. Just as the railroads opened opportunities across the vastness of a new country, the global telecommunications infrastructure is being built now in the new world, a world of opportunity for those who are connected. Connectivity is no longer a luxury. It's no longer an option. It's truly a requirement. We must push broadband connectivity to the corners of our country. Without it, we lose our competitive economic edge. I applaud the efforts of one community in Case Western for building the infrastructure to launch this opportunity. The demand for connectivity 
to, comp to compete in this increasingly connected world alone should be enough to justify the commitment to building these broadband networks. Unfortunately, every day we have to examine the economics of that and we have to find applications to justify the construction. What's important is that you, as the users of this new infrastructure, find creative ways to use this system, to economically improve our position, to, econ to improve our access, to improve what we have uh, every day in a competitive environment. It took 25 years to get the critical um, mass for cable television. It took nine years to get to critical mass for cell phones. The internet took only five. Internet users will grow to over two billion by 2011. Where will we be? Will we be in the leading position or not? Last slide, please. I challenge all of you to make use of this investment, to find creative applications to connect, enable, and transform everyday life. Congratulations on taking this first step, and thank you. Come on, thank you. First of all, I want to thank uh, Ryan for coming in today and uh, giving us his view of the globalization. In fact, technology is a transformation agent when he had some great examples there. Um, and since the theme today is about collaboration and, and tools, I, I first have to acknowledge that it takes a strong visionary, a leader, a champion, and someone to work outside the box without boundaries to even create an opportunity for collaboration. And I have to point out that Lev Gonick has been that for this community, for the creation of one community, and a great partnership between Case Western and one community now gives us uh, a, uh, the opportunity to begin to really engage uh, the community around us. Oh, sorry. This, um, can you go back all the way to the beginning? This is not, uh, or it's clicking right. Okay. Um, so what, I, what we wanted to announce today, basically, is we've been working on for some time with uh, Case Western, uh, a collaboration between uh, the university was already connected via Wi-Fi, and one community who had been working with developing broadband fiber infrastructure throughout the region to extend our existing network through wireless into the community. And it takes a lot of partners to do that, and I want to acknowledge Cisco, who's been a great partner and provided core infrastructure, Ninth Wave, who has helped us with the development of the portal, Proxim, which has provided equipment for a backhaul, my Wi-Fi Nation, who is actually helping us with back office and support infrastructure. So with that, next slide, please. Um, we are announcing today uh, Linked Communities, which is a wireless network that provides extension outside of Case Western and around the community uh, surrounding Case and into Cleveland Heights. Uh, it's through this partnership that we're able to offer this uh, capability, and we're excited about the uh, potential collaboration, the experimentation, uh, the innovation that can occur as a result of being untethered and providing access uh, even further outside the academic arena where we can work with the common citizen in other community collaborations, develop new uh, applications, new partnerships, and new programs. And so with that, we now go live today. Uh, this is our first day of actually being fully functional, and we're excited. Uh, to announce that today. Uh, with our partner in Ninth Wave, we created a, uh, a portal, and the whole context of creating the portal was to create a community dialogue and to open up uh, what's happening in our community to engage the community. We hope to develop on this and create things like community diaries and other things that will open up the discussion with it in the community, as well as provide current uh, contextual information about locality. One of the things we've begun to realize in our work, not only locally here, but across the US, is that local, local, local is very important. Globalization is key to success in economic development. So we want to bring those two together in a framework that empowers our community to really use this infrastructure, to leverage this infrastructure and work with others uh, to do so. Uh, this is just a quick map kind of showing our area of coverage and some of the things that we're doing in the, uh, on the area around CASE. There's a, uh, they don't all come out exactly the same color, but we have uh, fairly comprehensive coverage. 
Uh, we're hoping to hear back from the community and get feedback, and part of our agenda is using this as an experimental network, is we want to learn what you're doing. We want to learn about the applications you're trying out. We want to try to continue to develop and expand and grow this experiment so that this experiment can grow to meet the needs of the community of users uh, around us. And we hope to find and create more collaborative partnerships, much like Case, who has been strategic uh, as well as an investment partner in making this happen, uh, and so we can expand and grow this uh, within the uh, uh, community and, and the region. So we're excited to announce this today. So let me jump right in. And one of the things we wanted to be able to do is, since we're talking about collaboration, you know, what are the things that people are doing? You know, what's really happening out there? What does what is, what is wireless really begin to enable? And, um, and first of all, I'd like to introduce uh, Sean Zosky. And uh, he's the sound security specialist from Annexter and Firetide. And they've uh, actually done some amazing work. And I'd like to, uh, first of all, if you don't mind, just ask you a question, um, uh, Sean. Is, uh, you know, we're familiar with the use of broadband wireless. And, uh, you know, we hear about it in the papers and, and about the internet and access outside the home, et cetera. But what do you think is the most, uh, next most important use of such universally available uh, assets and technology? Um, I believe mostly it's going to uh, other parts of the community, tying in with the uh, police, the ambulance, um, uh, fire departments, and um, providing them a wireless feed uh, video-wise in their vehicles before they're de being deployed or on their way to deployment. So creating mobility for public safety and services and government? Absolutely. Awesome. So untethered access. Untethered, absolutely. I like that. I like that. Um, Tony um, Soreda is uh, Eastern Regional Wireless Products Manager from Motorola. Uh, Tony, Motorola has uh, you know, considerable resources for products. And I'm, I mean, you're well known for your wireless technology and the things that you do. Um, and uh, you optimize, you know, around operational wireless environments. Mm -hmm. So if you had to pick one, which one, what do you think would have the most impact and, and why would? Yeah, yeah, truly Motorola has uh, been in the wireless business for a long time, as you mentioned. And we're continuing to develop and optimize over the wireless network. Uh, it's a different animal. You know, everybody's been used to the wired, had a lot of uh, uh, ability to, to do faster things on a desktop. What we're looking for is pushing it out to the mobile environment, getting out to the officers in the cars. Uh, what we're looking at doing is making sure that they have all the information they have in a critical time with high availability. Uh, it's hard to put a pick on any one technology. I think the, the biggest focus these days is from, from Motorola's side is to make technology second nature. It's got to be easy to use. Uh, you can give them all the technology, all the exciting stuff of doing biometrics, fingerprinting, uh, all that kind of stuff from the vehicle into the car, but it's still got to be easy to use. So I'm kind of spinning around a little bit and saying it's not so much the technology, I think, but it's the ease of use that truly is what's going to make this you know, go forward. So, so what uh, is a follow-up question to that? Uh, when you talk about ease of use, you know, how, how, you know, we heard the example of the iPhone here and you know, attached to the hip, but you know, there's a lot of other, uh, you know, we just heard about public safety. How does this become, you know, what, what makes it easy to use? What we're finding out is once you have all this information, you mentioned the cameras, you know, that public safety has truly embraced cameras. You know, that kind of information, real time, to end up at a dispatch center is great. But what about into the vehicle? So now an officer is driving around, there's an incident, he can now, he or she can see the video in the vehicle, but how do you channel the right information to them? It's got to be ease of use so they can quickly pull up that kind of information, not have to fumble around with pulling up IP codes or, or, or websites that gives them access to hundreds of cameras. Somehow it's got to be an intuitive process. So maybe through their CAD system, the computer aid dispatch system, to then once a 911 call comes in, cameras identified that can pass the information, 
Dispatch realizes it, pushes out to the correct vehicle. Officer gets in his car, touch screen, see, zoom, pan, tilt, and all of a sudden they have the information. They know how to approach the situation. They know how to uh, react. They know when to ask for additional support if needed. So that's truly what uh, the end application really needs to take into consideration these days. And I think there's a lot of work going on in that field right now. So if I hear from that, you're talking about tools that make the technology transparent. Correct, second nature. That's okay, right. excellent, excellent. Say Joe, you know, Joe Podak is uh, basically Deputy Director of Operations and Performance Improvement for the Cleveland Metropolitan School District. Had the pleasure of working with Joe over the last uh, you know, couple of years. And, um, and they're doing amazing things uh, within the school district in the use of technology. Um, Joe, the school system has installed a large number of uh, security cameras in the district. And uh, how do you see the availability of wireless improving the use of, of those assets? Yeah. As we go through the construction project with the Ohio Schools Facilities Commission, when we're done with the project, we will have in excess of over 8,000 cameras in the school district. And the design spec for that is that there will be no blind hallways in the entire district. And that, like everybody else is saying, that's wonderful, but now what do you do to get access to all this um, technology? Through the use of the wireless technology, it does allow us to pull up to a building either through a mobile command center or a mobile patrol units. And if there was an incident in the school that we can actually see what is going on inside the school and make an assessment of how you're going to react to that incident. You know, there's a big difference between somebody running around the halls just being mischievous or if they have a pea shooter versus something more severe. And again, it's all about how you react to that um, incident and to get in there and do the appropriate action. Beyond just the camera side of this, uh, we do have full building automation systems that are online and we have access control systems that through the network we can actually unlock doors by just being able to see who's presented at a door and we can unlock doors remotely, we can change temperature in classrooms remotely and we can do a lot of um, monitoring of a building from anywhere in the city which is just fantastic. Well Joe, that's, that's awesome. So we're talking about all the applications and programs and administrators and services that help you know uh, really support a, a much larger community. But I'm gonna put you on the spot, Joe. What about the teachers and what about the students? Yeah, I mean, when you extend beyond the security issues that we're kind of talking about here, the intent of the district and also working with one community and other partners is how do you extend the classroom beyond the walls of the classroom into the home? Uh, the intent is to have a continuous learning process to be able to take the tools that the students can see in the classroom, the software, and also gain access to it at home. This is a unique challenge because with the SIPA laws for elementary students, we have to be a little more concerned with that and being able to bring them back in. And many of our students live in areas of the city that do not have access to any kind of internet connectivity. So the wireless network does give us an easy way to get into that environment. Awesome, Joe, thank you. Um, Judy, uh, Judy Miller is a founder and CEO of Ninth Wave, and I've had the pleasure of uh, interacting with Judy a lot over the last uh, few months. And uh, she's been very helpful in us creating a concept for uh, the portal for the community and to start to create some collaborative tools, which we hope to build and add over time as we uh, uh, develop the whole framework uh, for the community collaboration. Well, J Judy, what's the single most important feature of the portal and, that you've built for us? And, you know, we've talked about this being a very important project uh, as it relates to the impact and your act interaction with the community. And today we're talking about collaboration. So how, how does the portal play a role in, in the community and the environment in this space? Well, thank you, Mark, and it's wonderful to be here today. I would have to say the single most important feature is really the underlying theoretical framework um, that will allow us to deliver direct educational, economic, and public safety benefits to users and ultimately the community. We're hoping to be the civilian counterpart for public safety to what the work that Motorola and FireTide is doing by empowering citizens to take ownership of emergency mitigation and even prevention. Um, but the model, the theoretical model, is based on the work of Etienne Wenger's Community of Practice, and he did a lot of research in the corporate environment, and I combined that 
with the work of John Bransford and his uh, work on principles of learning, did a little bit of internet market research and came up with our portal design that has a, it's really based on a participation continuum from passive just consumption of news and information all the way to very active participation in online learning communities, which we're very excited about. We're launching with a, a little bit of everything, but we, we've we know it's going to take us a year or so to really implement the full engagement with the community, but we're hoping to um, really speed that process up as well. So thank you. Oh, that's great, Judy. Thanks. And Judy's been great to work with, and we've really enjoyed the opportunity. Um, you know, wanted to really just, again, kind of give you a sense, you know, of what it, people are doing. And as you listen to the panelists here, what you're hearing is a series of things that have to do with you know, public safety and government, and you hear some things that have to do with, you know, really administrative services and control systems, and you hear things about the students and the teachers, and you hear about community dialogue. And when we talk about collaborations and toolkits, we have to bring in all the potential players and partners that are going to work together to create the next form, next application, going to innovate the use of the network, and we're excited to have such panelists here to participate with, and I wanted to really thank you all for coming today. Um, the next thing I really wanted to just say is that the concept that we have here is open. This is an open network. This is a free network. We really are trying to promote experimentation. We're trying to promote demonstrations on the network, collaboration, and, and, and largely we want community engagement because we want to increase the adoption and use of technology, engage people in a way that they define the use of the network, not us. It's not our role to tell them how to use the network. We're only providing the infrastructure as an enabling uh, faction for them to, to be creative and innovative and transformative. So we're um, very excited about that. And uh, we really reach out to the community. We reach out to folks like yourselves to come back with feedback and suggestions and recommendations and give us insights on things that we should be doing to help enhance the experience and promote a much more open, collaborative uh, network throughout the uh, region. Next of all, I'd actually like to do is, is one of the things we wanted to be able to do here, and Jim, you're going to have to give me your password. You, I'm locked out. <laughs> okay. Um, we, we would like to uh, sort of demonstrate a, an application of the network. Wanda, this is Mark Ansbury. Can you hear me? Good morning, Mark. Yes, I can. Excellent. Thanks for joining us. I would like to um, introduce Wanda, who is uh, basically, she runs the Ashbury CTC, which is, oh, about eight blocks, 10 blocks away. And Wanda is actually uh, talking to us live over the wireless network. And, uh, and uh, Wanda, I, uh, Wanda, I have to tell you, or I uh, have to wish you a very, very happy birthday today. Um, what we want... Well, thank you very much. <laughs> um, that was a nice treat. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate it. So, Wanda, can you uh, tell us a little bit about the people you support through this facility? Yes, I to say good morning to President Snyder, uh, Lev, and, and my good friend Letitia over at CWRU. Uh, I'm always, I always like to be a part of uh, what you guys do over there. And I, I really want to start with it's just another great day in the neighborhood for Ashbury again. And uh, um, Ashbury actually was organized in 2002 as a nonprofit technology and information literacy training center. And our main mission was then and still is to bridge the digital divide and create solutions for digital inclusion. We have trained, and along with our partners, and I'll name them in just a minute, well over 650 greater Cleveland community residents in the uses of creative Microsoft applications, email, and the internet, and also job readiness. We've collaborated with, and my partners here, from Nico's uh, Foundation, uh, CWRU, of course, University Circle, Cleveland Housing Network, Cleveland Digital Vision, which is a uh, coalition of uh, uh, over 25 CTCs. CAP, our computers assisting people, which helped us with our refurbishing program. 
Glenville Development Corporation, and most currently Fairfax and the Eupers Court. We are continuing to seek uh, solutions for increased technology access, education, and training, which leads to personal economic empowerment. That is our goal, personal economic empowerment for everyone. And that's why we're excited about the One Community Network. It's not only access, it's about bringing people, education, and organization, businesses, and finally jobs together in our community. Boy, that's great, Wanda. Can, can you give me, a, you know, how do you anticipate that the availability of the network will impact the need for uh, computer and applications training? that's going to have a great uh, impact on our, our community. Workforce development will increase. Uh, community meetings will, in, will be possible. We'll also be able to have classes in our seniors' homes that actually can't leave the home. There's possible marketing for small businesses and organizations in our community. Uh, we definitely want to get up a community neighborhood blog and get our seniors, our young folks communicating on, on the internet with, with each other and most certainly uh, neighborhood safety watch. I have with me here Amy uh, from Famico's Foundation, and uh, she can actually add just a couple more things that uh, the uh, increased band broadband will bring for us. Oh, good morning. Um, we're we're thinking now about how how we can use this new awesome technology to support local businesses and um, create create community gathering spaces in the neighborhood that promote safety, um, community building, and technology technology usage among the residents in this area and we're very excited to be part of all of this. Well, we are definitely glad to have you all as partners and working so hard in the community as you are. Can, can you tell me a little bit, Wanda, about what you're doing today and, uh, you know, what are the students uh, in the neighborhood, how they're participating? Oh, I think I forgot. Say, Wanda, can you, can you tell me what you guys are up to today and, and how some of the uh, students in the neighborhood are participating? Uh, yes, I can. Right now, we're just hanging out, being a part of uh, your program today. Uh, but I can also tell you a lot of things we've been doing uh, and what we do here at the uh, center. Uh, we have in-depth Microsoft Office suite applications from basic beginning to advanced classes. We have our Internet uh, Computer Core, IC3 Computer Core Competency, competency Skills Certification class in which Famico and I are partners. And that's where we, we train uh, youth 17 and up for job entry level positions. Uh, we are actually part of the e for me distance learning now. We're encouraging people that can't get out or don't have the flexibility to come into our classroom to start learning online. Well, we actually have a, a partnership with our Med, My Med, Medicare Information and Literacy uh, Coalition with Meridia Huron Road Cleveland Clinic Hospital. Uh, we also have financial literacy. We even get a chance to do Shape It, uh, a health information class and some physical stuff while we're in class. And one of the main things that we all provide at all of our centers is to technology for neighborhood and families. Area residents drop in for different homework assignments and research papers. So we do a lot. And we're also part of the uh, Cuyahoga County VITA Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program Coalition. And I think one of the community had something to do with that to make sure that that happened for all of Cuyahoga County. Well, Wanda, I really want to thank you for participating today. Uh, we really appreciate your insights and the good work you're doing. Keep it up. Oh, thank you. We're, like I say, we're glad to be a part, and hopefully I'll see you over there sometime today to take part in some of that learning that's going on. Have a great day. Thanks again, Wanda.
Um, basically, want to thank you all very much for uh, participating. This is give you an example. We got some work to do to optimize the video, and we've got some, you know, things that uh, we can need to continue to work on. But that's what we're looking for to the community to give us feedback and, and work with us. We actually left some brochures out here to talk a little bit about the Link community uh, goals and objectives in the program. And if you're wanting to get access to the network, there's some information in here. And I want to thank Lev and Case for hosting this today and the opportunity to participate in this great day of collaboration. Thank you.